when testifying in court. Some reflections as well on victim sensitive courts from the perspective of a prosecutor in handling vulnerable victims, including some insights from experiences of victims who have gone through the criminal justice process. And at this time, allow me to formally introduce our speakers in the sequence that they will be speaking. First, we have Dr. David Wells. Uh, Dr. Wells is an associate professor of the, in the Department of Forensic Medicine at Monash University and has held a similar role in the Department of Pediatrics. He developed the International Postgraduate Program in Forensic Medicine at Monash University. This program is the entry point for specialization in this field and has students from Africa, the Americas, Europe, Asia, and the Pacific region. Previously, he served as the forensic medicine, as the head of forensic medicine at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine for 19 years. While he retains a role in the forensic medicine, his recent activities have been as a teacher, uh, both for undergraduate and graduate med medicine at Monash. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Dr. David Wells. Uh, Dr. David, if you can just say hi to our participants this afternoon, please. Hello all, good afternoon or good evening. Thank you so much, Dr. David. And our second speaker is Prosecutor Lloyd Babb. Uh, Prosecutor Babb became the new Director of Prosecutions in New South Wales on the 18th July, uh, I think, uh, was it 2011? Uh, he attained his Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Laws degrees from Macquarie University in 1989. He was awarded a Rotary International Foundation Scholarship, which enabled him to complete a Master's in Criminal Justice from the University of Illinois in Chicago. He was admitted as a solicitor of the Supreme Court of New South Wales in 1991, but this was soon followed by another per period of study abroad this time as a visiting fellow at Copenhagen University's Institute of Criminology between September 1992 and June 1993. And then he returned to Australia in November 1993 after a brief spell as DJ Fisher at, in DJ Fisher and Associates. He moved to the Office of the Director of Prosecutions where he served as a solicitor advocate. In making his announcement, about his appointment, Mr. Babb, Attorney General Greg Smith said, Mr. Babb has proven himself to be a lawyer of the highest quality who is well versed in all aspects of criminal law. It is an honor to have you Lloyd. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. And at this point, it is also my honor to introduce our reactor both as a reactor and as speaker, ladies and gentlemen, we have Ibu Rita Pranawati. She is the vice chair of the Indonesian Commission on Child Protection for... Child Protection for the term 2017 to 2022. She is also serving as the commissioner for National Commission on Child Protection uh, of Indonesia since 2014 up to 2022. She is a lecturer at Hamka University in Jakarta and a researcher at the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture at Sharif Hidayatullah State Islamic University in Jakarta. Ms. Pranawati participated in the Australia-Indonesia Muslim Exchange Program in 2010 and was awarded a Master of Arts in Sociology at Monash University in 2012. Ms. Pranawati's study in Australia allowed her to experience firsthand Australia's respect for its citizens, regardless of their faith, ethnicity, and skin color. In her career as a commissioner, academic, and social activist, Iburita says she continues to enjoy close cooperative relationship with Australians in government and civil society. 
with whom she collaborates on issues of child protection, women's empowerment, and religious dialogue. She is a recipient of many awards, and that includes the 2011 Alison Sudrajat Award of Australian Leadership and the Australian Leadership Award Scholarship in 2011. Happy to note too that she is an International Visitor Leadership Program alumnus in 2018. Um, just I think just after my IVLP uh, fellowship as well, Iburita. Uh, uh, it is honor to have you with us. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you all here, and we can share uh, our experience uh, to help a victim uh, from their uh, situation. Definitely. Thank you so much. All right, now. On to our first conversation to talk about the value of forensic medicine in investigation and prosecution of cases involving sexual violence and exploitation and the need for multidisciplinary sexual violence interventions. I would like to give the floor now to Dr. David Wells. Dr. Wells, you have the floor. Well, firstly, thank you very much. Um, for the honor of speaking at this meeting on a topic that I think is critically important um, uh, reflection on how we manage uh, vulnerable individuals. I need to start by making a few confessions. Uh, the first is that my uh, presentation is largely built around my experiences uh, in my homeland, Australia, um, where I've been working as a forensic medical practitioner for 30 odd years. Um, although I will note that I have uh, worked and lived in Southeast Australia, uh, Southeast Asia for many years as well. Secondly, that um, there will be some obvious biases in what I say. I'm merely a doctor. Um, I know very little about the law, so please excuse uh, my naiveties about any comments uh, about the law. And thirdly, most of my work um, has been uh, providing medical services to victims of what we call interpersonal violence. That is violence between one individual or multiple individuals and others. And although I have been involved in trafficking cases, uh, most of what follows will be uh, built on my cases of interpersonal violence, particularly domestic violence, sexual violence, child abuse. And I'd like to think that um, there is considerable overlap. I don't think they're two separate categories of individuals. Victims of trafficking, victims of um, interpersonal violence, domestic violence, are by definition vulnerable individuals um, who have been exploited, who have been threatened, um, who are now alone, um, traumatized, uh, ashamed, uh, possessing major impacts on their health, um, their social networks and their finances. And they're also victims of a range of bias, biases, uh, myths and misconceptions. So I think a program such as this, if there are changes, it will do um, both groups of individuals, whether they be victims of trafficking, victims of other forms of violence, uh, some considerable benefit. Can I have the next slide? That, could I have the second slide, please? I might, I might just keep going. Um, so I think the, the one of the first issues that I wanted to um, make clear is that in many communities, um, in many societies, there is a belief that violence is just a normal part of life. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, this is not behaviours um, that are inherent in our community. So over the next half hour, I'd like to just explore a little bit around violence, um, its incidents and its impacts to talk a little bit about forensic medicine and the interface of forensic medicine and the criminal justice system. And then 
what I perceive to be what might be some improvements uh, that could be made to uh, change this process. Thank you. Next slide, please. So there are many different forms of violence. Um, most of these will be clear to you, but today we'll be largely talking around interpersonal violence. So violence between an individual and another individual, although particularly in trafficking related matters, um, many of these relate to economic gain for certain individuals by trafficking others. Um, they may also, in the form of trafficking, be used to create um, ruptures in a community or a society or fear um, because of what is happening to these individuals. Next slide, please. We also need to realise that um, although the media um, are very quick to focus on uh, extreme violence that comes to the public eye, the vast majority of violence uh, occurs behind closed doors and usually in the household of either the victim or the perpetrator. Um, these are not events that are well publicised or seen, they're hidden. Um, so we, as a community, don't really uh, fully understand the sheer size of this problem. It's fair to say that this is one of the most significant public health issues confronting every single society. Uh, this is not an Australian problem, it's not an American problem, it is a problem that confronts every society. Next slide, please. With violence, and whether it be uh, physical violence, whether it be trafficking, uh, whether it be other forms of violence, um, there are major consequences for not only the individual, uh, but the individual's family and community. Just focusing on the individual for a moment, the health consequences alone are enormous. And I've listed there some of the short and long-term health consequences of this. It's widely accepted in a lot of the developed countries that um, the health consequences of violence consume a massive amount of each government's um, uh, money, if you like, each year, whether it be in the legal system, the health system or the social system. Um, these are an enormous uh, drain on a government's uh, finances. But more critically, uh, for many of the individuals who have health consequences of violence, they never make a complete recovery. Hence, they will be covering or carrying uh, the various scars of these behaviours for the rest of their lives. And perhaps most depressingly, um, those consequences are passed on to the next generation. So young children will also experience um, the consequences of their mothers or fathers' um, ill health as a result of actions of violence. Next slide, please. We also need to acknowledge that violence in its various forms, including trafficking, does irreparable damage to the social fabric. Um, of small or larger communities. It, um, it, it causes extreme disruption of families, but at a wider level, um, major problems in relationships, either at home, at school or at work, and a significant deterioration in performance of uh, children attending schools or uh, individuals in employment. Next slide, please. I've touched a little bit on the economic consequences. Um, I don't know the size of this problem in most countries. In the countries I do know, um, this is a problem that um, is, is effectively draining the coffers of the health, uh, the legal um, and social um, support services. In addition, there are other issues relating to the quality of work, absenteeism, et cetera. So in a very small nutshell, uh, interpersonal violence, whether it be in a form of trafficking or something else, um, has devastating impacts um, on individuals and communities. Let's put that aside just for a minute and um, now just touch on some of the forensic uh, components. Uh, next slide, please.
So forensic um, is largely um, the issue of an interface of medicine and the law coming from the Latin um, uh, for forum. So next slide, please. We see um, a considerable overlap uh, between health and law and human rights. Um, that's encapsulated in that process of, of, of um, those pro procedures. Next slide, please. So what do we do in forensic medicine? As I mentioned, most of uh, our work relates to violence and that might be interpreting injuries. Um, all of you have seen the, the various uh, forensic shows on television. I need to tell you it's nothing like that. Um, it's very different. Uh, it's nowhere near as uh, simple, um, as riveting, as sexy perhaps as some of those shows uh, make it out to be. It's hard work, it's very confronting, um, and it tends to focus on the darker side of human behavior. We also deal with children, uh, which is particularly uh, challenging uh, with drugs, particularly the effects of drugs on behavior or perhaps on driving. And so our role in these is largely around to assist in the delivery of medical interventions, that is resuscitating people, um, assisting them to recover. Also around documentation, documentation of what was told to us by uh, alleged victims or by police or by witnesses. To collect relevant specimens uh, that might show a connection between an individual and another individual or an individual and a scene. These all become critically important in many of these cases. To write reports, um, these are primarily for investigators or for the courts themselves. And finally, to give evidence in court. So that, I suppose, in a very brief nutshell, uh, encapsulates uh, forensic medicine. Next slide, please. So who, who are our patients? Um, effectively, anyone in the community uh, could be uh, require a forensic service at some stage, either um, outside a hospital, within an emergency department, in intensive care, or unfortunately, sometimes also in the mortuary. What I've listed on that slide is the groups that are grossly overrepresented as victims uh, of um, um, interpersonal violence or trafficking. Most of them are fairly obvious, children, women, particularly also the people with physical or mental disabilities, um, some of the indigenous communities um, and others I've left there. So it's important that we accept that individuals who perpetrate these crimes select certain vulnerable individuals. And there are a range of reasons for that. Um, but if you look at that list, that represents a lot of people within each community. Next slide, please. So the, the principles on which forensic medicine is practiced um, are really fairly straightforward. I mean, one of the, the key ones relates to sensitivity or compassion. You're dealing with individuals who have been through an extraordinarily traumatic experience. Many of these people thought they were going to die. And so it would be wrong of us to say, I know what you're going through. None of us would have an idea. We might say, I can only imagine what you must be going through. But um, these are people who have lived through an experience that hopefully none of us will ever have to do. One of the other elements that moves closely with this is objectivity. Um, we can be compassionate, but we also need to be absolutely objective in our interpretation of findings. We are not there to provide um, evidence or, or evidence only positive to one case, one side or the other. Um, we are there effectively to report the facts and if asked, an opinion. But that opinion must be based on facts. It can't be a whim it can't be because we've developed a, an association or a sorrow for the, the victim. 
So a lot of this is around informed decision making. But somehow in all of this, and I think medicine is well placed to do this, um, we must develop and maintain a patient centric service. Our service is about um, retrieving people from a very difficult situation and helping them on the road to recovery. It does not, however, mean that we are there as their advocates in court. Um, we are there to report the facts as we saw them and interpret them if necessary. Next slide, please. I just wanted to touch now on some of the um, misbeliefs, if you like, around two or three types of cases, whether it be trafficking, whether it be violence. Because out there in the wider world, there is a lot of misinformation about what is found um, and what should be found. And this drives thinking and processes. So for instance, and these are based on some very large studies and I'd be happy to provide the papers um, or the research uh, from which these are drawn. But if you look at cases of child sexual abuse, whether it be on little boys or little girls, and you examine them immediately, they present less than 5% of all of them, 3% of girls, 1% of boys will have an objective sign of injury. In fact, less than 5%. And yet out there, there is a feeling that if a child has been sexually molested, they must have an injury. Therefore, if they don't have an injury, the story is untrue or incorrect. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So it's critically important we understand that um, a normal finding or a normal examination in young children is the usual scenario. It doesn't mean that nothing has happened. And rarely in these cases are witnesses uh, to the act and rarely does DNA help. Um, it's, it's simply not transferred. Next slide, please. The second sort of set of myths, if you like, if you can just roll through that slide, um, it's unfortunately, it's, that's it. And the next two or three more. One more, that's perfect. So, we know that most offences are uh, perpetrated by males and the victims are females. In the vast majority of cases, um, the two parties are known to each other before these assaults. So rapes committed by total strangers, certainly in Australia and from my experience in most other countries, um, are very rare events. And most are committed in either offenders or victims' homes. And it's interesting, when I started my career, I was consistently asked by police, this is probably a false report, isn't it, doctor? Either based on the fact that the victim was unable to give a very clear account of what happened, or perhaps her story varied a little bit, or there were no injuries, or she was intoxicated. We know that false reports of sexual offences are very rare. And generally, they're so obvious um, that they don't require a sophisticated uh, screening process at all. Next slide, please. Similarly, as I talked about in children, after rapes, and now I'm talking about women um, past puberty, um, of sexually active women, uh, etc. Again, injuries are rare. And now just focusing on genital injuries or anal injuries, these are very uncommon. Um, perhaps 10%, 15% of women who present very soon after alleging a rape will we see a genital or an anal injury. Making this even more challenging in its interpretation is that consenting intercourse may also produce injuries. Um, again, I'm very happy to share the papers or research with you. So in the majority of cases where there is non-consenting intercourse, that is, for most jurisdictions, a rape, there are no injuries uh, evident on the examination. Add to that that most complainants of sexual assault will not present quickly for a medical examination. They might present at 24 hours, 48 hours, sometimes a week or so later. 
very minor genital injuries or anal injuries are gone by then. So what might have been a very small abrasion or a bruise has healed. And the doctor performing the examination says, well, there was nothing to see. Not surprising. Next slide, please. Now, the third element, I've talked a little bit about child sexual abuse, a little bit about adult sexual abuse, and now a little bit about this domestic or family violence from a forensic uh, perspective. It might interest you to know that between 2000 and 2006, three and a half, nearly 3,500 American soldiers were killed in combat. In those seven years, three times that number of women died as a result of violence by their partner. So we often think, reflect on victims of war, but while that's going on, there is a war happening in our own households and in our own homes. And you can apply that figure adjusted slightly to Australia and to other countries. And th this first line here about the leading cause, I find that one of the most depressing aspects of my work that in Australia, first world country, developed country, um, caring for human rights, the leading cause in women aged between 25 and 44 of illness, disability and death is violence. Violence usually at the hand of their partner. Um, this is profoundly depressing. Next slide, please. This is a photograph, and it's the only photograph I'll show, of a young girl who I saw um, in an emergency department where she had been sexually assaulted. I think she was a teenage girl, and um, no one had looked at her neck. They were focused on her genital area or other aspects. This is what I saw on her neck. She had lost consciousness during this assault. And when I spoke to her, she said the last thing she remembered was that the assailant put his hands around her neck and squeezed. These are very subtle changes. They're tiny little um, blood blisters or tiny little bruises in the neck. And what has happened there can also happen on the face and may also happen in the brain. She sustained brain damage as a result of her oxygen supply to the brain being deprived during this moment of asphyxiation. It's a very minor injury, it's a very subtle injury, and it can be missed. But increasingly, we're aware of the fact that people who apply uh, neck pressure, um, the distance between living and dying is tiny, absolutely tiny. Next slide, please. So, Similarly, as I mentioned, some of the myths or misbeliefs around child, uh, child sexual abuse and adult sexual um, assault cases, we have a series of myths around domestic violence that I, I just thought I'd share with you. The first myth is that the home is a safe place, and yet this is where the vast majority of these incidents occur. Secondly, there's a belief out there that this sort of thing just happens to a few unlucky people or that there is some genetic predisposition on the part of either the female or the male. Again, totally untrue. Many of you, and, I, and Lloyd will speak to this a little bit, um, that restraining orders and shelters um, are always effective. Um, that is not the case. They have their place, a very important place, but it is no guarantee that violence will not continue um, or that individuals don't remain violent. Uh, don't remain um, safe. And finally, once you start to get visible signs of violence, and I'll go back to that slide of the young girl, um, this is something that the level of violence has escalated enormously because most cases of violence, again, will not um, produce injuries on the individual. Next slide. Just very briefly, we know that in cases of uh, domestic violence, and, and probably in, in other cases of violence, most of the complainants or victims are much more likely to be experiencing other significant legal problems in their life, family uh, court, civil courts. And there was a survey done 
uh, recently in which 80% of individuals respondents who um, had experienced family violence um, rated at least one of the legal problems as having just as a severe impact on their everyday life as the, um, as the physical assault themselves. So again, vulnerable individuals with a lot of baggage um, that needs to be teased out, thought out and um, addressed as part of the, the problem. Next slide, please. So I think it's fair to say that we're dealing, whether it be in people trafficking, whether it be in, um, in victims, we have got some massive disincentives uh, to reporting. Many of these people uh, think they know a little bit about the court process, either from watching television, from stories that others have told, um, or perhaps a prior experience in court themselves. We also need to accept that traffickers uh, or assailants choose vulnerable individuals. Um, the same group that cannot or will not, or don't have the wherewithal to go to court effectively making these offences um, you know, un un unpunishable. Next slide, please. So, and again, I apologise for my legal colleague. These are some comments that um, about the court system, the legal system, the whole of the criminal justice system, um, as to why people have said they perhaps won't report. Um, particularly around inflexibility, um, a lack of sensitivity, it's complicated, it's inaccessible. Um, remember also that the, the individuals that actually make it to court represent the tip of the iceberg. Um, for every 10 people who are physically or sexually assaulted, perhaps one or two uh, will actually have their day in court, not necessarily because of problems with the court system, but rather um, many individuals will withdraw from the case, will not want to continue. And this becomes extremely frustrating for the police, for lawyers and others who invest a lot into this process. Next slide, please. I just wanted to finish um, with a few, and these are very personal thoughts. Uh, you can roll all of those through if you can. That's it. Um, around how we might improve this service. I'm not going to read them through, but I thought very quickly that we need to understand and need to acknowledge that violence is complex, it's difficult, um, but we do need to address it. Secondly, that the legal system, just as the medical system, just as the health system, just as the social system, does have a very important part to play in prevention. Thirdly, that the consequences of violence are not restricted to that individual at that time. Um, they play out at uh, a range of levels, either socially, um, in the family, and to the next generation. Next slide, please. I'm a little bit biased, but I think we, we do need to explore alternative mechanisms to receive complaints and allegations. Let me just share with you um, a brief anecdote. When I started in my work many years ago, I didn't really comprehend uh, the whole issue of why people would not want to progress with their complaint. So I asked, I did a little survey amongst colleagues, 10 doctors, 10 lawyers, and 10 police officers, all female. And I asked them, if you were assaulted, sexually assaulted by someone you knew, would you report it? The answer, 100% said no. Now, I found that extraordinary. Here are people who work in the system, who are investing their lives in a system, and yet don't have the level of faith or confidence that they would use that system themselves. Very sobering. Another issue relates to um, uh, education. Uh, as I say, there are a lot of myths. Um, these are widespread within the community, and lawyers, uh, judges, police officers, doctors, and others a part of that community, um, a, a significant belief that um, many victims bring it on themselves, um, that the reason they withdraw from the case is because it was a false report, etc. 
delays also impact negatively and we must find some way of reducing delays. Um, many of these cases are not that sophisticated. They don't rely on a lot of other witnesses or other material evidence. And yet regularly in my own jurisdiction, um, I will be going to court on cases that happened three or five years ago. Um, how people are expected to remember the details to live a normal life for that three or five years is beyond me. Next slide, please. So at the moment, certainly in my own system, we have these silos of, of, of police, of courts, of medical and social, and rarely um, does there, is there much interchange across the two. We have to address that. Um, and I've listed there a number of other um, changes as well. All of the interactions have to be multidisciplinary. So why can't we have multidisciplinary teams um, investigating, prosecuting, et cetera, rather than passing it on from one hand to the next. Unless we make some changes, unless we do something, um, and I'm not talking about cosmetic changes, um, then we will continue this whole cycle of re-victimisation and re-traumatisation to the most vulnerable and powerless members of our community. So how do we do it? Next slide, please. Really, how we do it is up to uh, each system. But standing back, what might a good system look like? How do we get there? I mean, uh, let's consider we're not, in fact, lawyers or judges or whatever we might be, but we're selling a product. We ask the victim, we ask the client what they want. What about their experiences? How can we improve the service? And critically, we challenge a lot of the myths, beliefs and biases that are inherent in our process. So effectively, what I'm asking, I suppose, is if this was your daughter, your sister, your wife, how would a system look like that you would be comfortable with them being part of it? Final slide, please. In short, at the moment, uh, most of the victims we see, whether of trafficking, whether of other forms of violence, um, are invisible. They're either silent because they don't report or they're silent because the system overwhelms them. The real challenge for all of us uh, from now on is to develop a process that is accessible, um, professional, and that we're proud to be part of rather than something we say is too hard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. David Wells. And well, thank you indeed for your thought provoking and also extraordinary challenge to some of the contemporary beliefs on how to handle victims of violence. And it was extraordinary for me that to hear some of your colleagues who not even report cases of sexual violence against them. Uh, Right, but I will reserve uh, some of those thoughts for Iborita later on. And at this time, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite Prosecutor Lloyd Babb as the next presenter. Prosecutor Babb will discuss his reflections on victim-sensitive courts and their role in the prosecution of cases involving vulnerable witnesses, including victims of trafficking. Uh, Prosecutor Lloyd, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can I start by uh, saying that I'm the uh, leader of the prosecution agency that uh, covers Sydney and the, the biggest population state in Australia. We have um, 850 prosecutors. And if I could bring up my second slide please, I'll tell you firstly about a service that we offer within our office that supports people before they go to court. Because I think that a victim sensitive court system begins with good preparation by the prosecution. So in 1995, my office set up the witness assistance service and we now have uh, 51 uh, witness assistance officers who are psychologists or social workers and their job is to assist victims 
in navigating what is a very challenging and onerous criminal justice system. They, they're very busy in that each um, WAZO would have between 80 to 100 open cases in, in their workload. Uh, matters that are automatically uh, registered to a WAS officer are all death matters, homicides, and all sexual assault matters. Sexual assault matters form one third of the total work of my office. So uh, they would form a much higher percentage, perhaps 70% of those matters that run through to trial in the criminal justice system. That is where guilt is challenged. Many of the other crimes, guilt is admitted in advance of trial, but sexual assault, particularly child sexual assault offenders seem to be very reluctant to acknowledge guilt in advance of a trial. Uh, other matters that are uh, given to was officers to assist the victims are those um, where there's been uh, extreme trauma um, inflicted upon the victim or where they're vulnerable, particularly vulnerable. So children, people with mental ill health or cognitive impairment. So um, last year we had 2,560 such cases that were registered to the, the witness assistance officers. Next slide, thank you. The aim of uh, the witness assistance unit is uh, to do two things, prepare the witness to give evidence well in court. So increase the prospects of successful prosecution and support them through what is a uh, a stressful time and uh, an experience that can re-traumatise uh, victims of violent crimes, in particular sexual sexual crimes, to uh, to minimise the that re-traumatisation is one of the central aims of the witness assistance unit, and generally they're very caring people with the right sort of background so that uh, they're able to assist the, the victims. Next slide, thank you. Now, uh, effective court support uh, involves the witness assistance officers providing a link between the victim and the system. And they are able to Firstly, do that by educating the victim in advance of the criminal um, trial, by demystifying the process, giving them information and explaining the process. Typically, a witness assistance officer would take a victim over to court and show them the empty courtroom in advance of them uh, attending court. Uh, they would introduce them to the prosecutors who are going to be handling uh, their case and then they would sit with them throughout the, the case to provide support to them, uh, particularly in relation to those with special needs. They also assist them with the technology and many of our victims aren't appearing in court um, in a way where they're exposed to the offender. So they're appearing from a room where the only person that they're together with will be uh, the witness assistance and support person. They ensure that practical needs are met. So one of the key things they, they do is make sure that all the expenses that the witness faces in getting to, to court and in taking time off work are met by my office. They also ensure that there's a safe environment both within our office and within the courtrooms where they feel safe waiting and feel safe in participating in the system. They provide emotional and psychological support. And after a trial, they're able to debrief and uh, put the, the victim in touch with crisis counseling. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, what they don't do, however, is provide legal advice. They don't discuss the evidence with the, uh, with the, the victim. They take notes of what they do discuss with them because the last thing that we want is 
for the the process to be re- derailed, for the criminal trial to be undermined by uh, by a psychologist or a social worker performing an inappropriate task, that is discussing the legal aspects of the case, coaching a witness and explaining to them how they um, they should answer questions. What they can do is talk to them about telling the truth and explain to them the limitations on the questions that can be asked and the, the different rights that are available under legislation. And I'm just going to go through some of them that are available in uh, in my country. So uh, most vulnerable witnesses, including all sexual assault victims, have the right to appear from a remote location. They have the right to have a support person of their choice present with them at the time of giving evidence. There are restrictions on improper questions. So if a, uh, a lawyer for an accused person asks a humiliating or degrading question, that must be rejected by the judge. If they want to ask questions about prior sexual experience, for example, um, have you had sex before this occasion? That's an improper question that must be rejected by the judge. The, if an accused person chooses to represent themselves, then there is an absolute prohibition on them asking questions of the victim. A third party, an intermediary, will be given written questions and ask them on the behalf of the unrepresented accused to reduce the trauma of that direct confrontation. We uh, limit the provision of sensitive evidence to an accused person. So uh, photographs that uh, might be titillating to some types of offenders aren't provided to the accused. They're provided to their lawyers on, we use a, a, a locked, um, in the cloud um, uh, method of letting the lawyers look at the exhibits that they want to be able to look at, but not giving them to an accused person so that they can get some sort of gratification out of the photos or the statements. Any uh, communications that a sexual assault victim have with a psychologist for the purposes of treatment are subject to a communications privilege and can't be uh, made available to the defence. Uh, the, in relation to children in particular, we have uh, provisions where they, the questioning from the lawyer has to go through what's called a, an, a witness intermediary. So a psychologist or someone with specialist training about the cognition and understanding of children who will inform the court as to whether the question that's being asked is suitable for a child of that age to understand. So for example, uh, double-barreled questions. Adults might be able to to understand questions that build and put in uh, premise before the question. Children don't. So the witness intermediary will then uh, interpret whether the question is, is suitable for a child of that age. Next slide, thank you. Uh, we try and limit the amount of time that a vulnerable witness needs to appear in court. So uh, we do have a multidisciplinary team uh, that David uh, has discussed at the investigation stage. So we'll have health workers working together with police to try and ask uh, the right questions of the, the victim and they specialist training if you're taking statements from vulnerable witnesses such as sexual assault victims or child sexual assault victims. Those statements are recorded on video and they're played as evidence in court to save the victim the re-traumatisation of having to go through the event yet another time. There, in any preliminary hearings, it's absolutely prohibited that you ask questions of uh, the victim. So they'll only ask, answer questions in cross-examination by the, uh, the lawyer for the accused once. And we have specific provisions that require that uh, the wishes of the vulnerable person be taken into account as to where and how they give their evidence. There are limits, of course, to, uh, 
to what can be done because uh, at the end of the day, our system is an adversarial system and the right to a, a fair trial is, is very important. But at the same time, it shouldn't be a trial by ordeal. It shouldn't be, the aim of the, the process shouldn't be to wear victims out and traumatise them so much that they either choose not to proceed further or choose not to come forward because the experience has been so horrific. So uh, a lot of what we're doing is trying to make the experience as, um, as good as possible. It's still going to be a terrible experience. It's still going to be very difficult. But as the, the head of the organization, I ask that all letters, both of complaint and praise come through to me. And I get a lot of letters praising the compassion and the engagement that both the lawyers and the social workers and psychologists within the organization show towards uh, victims of vulnerable victims of, of sexual assault crime and other violent crime. I've just got a slide up on, on the screen now and uh, it can uh, be made uh, available. I'd welcome you looking at these different uh, websites because I think they're very useful in terms of what's available and also what we use to, um, to assist the victims in navigating the process. And the last one I can't take credit for, that's what I think is excellent material available in Canada um, as court preparation. Thank you uh, very much for your time. I, uh, I am highlighting some of the positive aspects of, of our system. I don't, um, I don't suggest it's, it's a perfect system. Uh, in many cases, I, I do see cases that, that have been a terrible ordeal for the victims, but it really has been a mission of mine to, to try and make my office very sensitive to the needs of victims and try and make the process as, as, um, as least traumatizing as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lloyd, and also to Dr. David. Of course, uh, Dr. David was unnecessarily apologetic. And, uh, I and for Lloyd, on the other hand, I like how you used the term mission, at, that it is your mission to provide a victim-sensitive environment for uh, victims of violent crimes, especially women and children. And at this time, I would like to invite Iborita Pranawati to give her reactions to the presentations of Dr. Wells and Prosecutor Babb from the perspective of vulnerable victims of children who have gone through the criminal justice process. But before I give the floor to Ibo Rita, I'd like to invite our audience to please post your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, you may post a question in general or to specific a speaker, either to Dr. David or to Prosecutor Lloyd. Uh, to all of our panelists, I think it may bode well to inform you that we have a lot of prosecutors in the audience at this time, also a lot of court workers and judges who are with us. So I'm pretty sure that we're going to receive smart questions and I'm very happy to facilitate that later. But this time I'd like to invite Iborita to take the floor. Uh, Iborita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I will respond to the Wells and uh, Pep uh, presentation. Uh, I think I, uh, this is a good presentation and I will uh, underline uh, some issues. Uh, firstly, uh, as a victim, uh, mostly in the, for example, patriarchy culture or uh, top-down culture, which is power relation in the society and the family uh, is still uh, a big gap. So uh, victim is not easy to tell their experience, uh, especially for the children. Uh, is it true what uh, David said that uh, the, the victim are silent or silence victim because they are uh, afraid to tell the story? For, uh, for the children, for example, um, because their daily uh, communication with the parents is still top down, just need one answer question from the parent. Uh, do you have uh, 
uh, lunch for example only say yes so when they got a problem as a victim uh, for the uh, sexual against children uh, they are very difficult to say uh, to tell the story uh, uh, the second is uh, about the culture of the society when they got a trouble uh, their children be, uh, become a, a victim of the uh, uh, child abuse. Uh, they are afraid sometimes to tell to other to report to the police because uh, they think that uh, there will be a long process. And uh, there is also the stig stigmatization from the society. Uh, even uh, the children is uh, the, the children are victim. But against uh, they are becoming uh, another victim or revictimized by the society because uh, you, uh, as a parent, for example, you not perform well for your uh, for your uh, kids, for example. This is also difficult. That's why uh, uh, parents sometimes cannot uh, accept the situation, and uh, it's difficult to support the children is also another uh, problem and uh, i agree that we should do maximum aid to reduce the physical and psychological suffering uh, for the victim while uh, uh, we understand that uh, the the victim needs uh, long uh, rehabilitation uh, sometimes short but sometimes also long uh, but uh, as a matter of fact that in Indonesia, uh, Indonesian Commission on Child Protection has a research in 2019 that only 48.3% 40, that uh, victim, uh, children victim can be rehabilitated uh, properly because uh, sometimes also uh, the, the financial matters, uh, sometimes because family not support and sometimes the program is uh, just enough because uh, the rehabilitation uh, time is only six months. Uh, this is like the uh, operational procedure. Uh, that's uh, another problem that uh, uh, it is better also, uh, I agree with you, that uh, uh, to, to uh, prevent, is uh, prevention is much more important because this is a very uh, less cost rather than if they are becoming victim this is very difficult because uh, the situation uh, will impact to the uh, social life school and work productivity in the future uh, this is not easy but again um, sometimes the situation is uh, not easy in, uh, especially in Indonesia uh, in terms of law enforcement process uh, it is also a human resources will define how they assess the children as a victim. Uh, they need to use a children language, but sometimes they didn't uh, get uh, any training uh, properly. So uh, it's also not easy uh, in terms of um, law enforcement. Even in the judge, uh, there are many uh, judges that get a child-friendly certificate uh, to uh, assess the uh, children case. Uh, I agree with uh, Beb's uh, uh, presentation that sometimes we need also to take uh, ex uh, to take uh, the testimony from the victim uh, by video because sometimes children are not easy uh, to tell many times. Uh, uh, so when they uh, tell many times, it it becomes uh, a trauma. Uh, trauma uh, they will become traumatic again. Uh, this is also we do in 2014 with one of the case, the big case, uh, sexual against children in Jakarta. Uh, we do a court uh, to give uh, children testimony as a victim. Uh, even uh, sometimes also the connection become a problem uh, during this situation, but uh, we do practice in 2014. And... Uh, the protection of the children as a witness also important. Uh, in Indonesia, we do have a juvenile uh, justice, uh, criminal justice system, uh, but mostly uh, the legal rights come to uh, the children in conflict with the law rather than to the victim or the witness. 
this is the situation because uh, in the uh, criminal justice system law, we need access, uh, we need access uh, the children uh, properly, but sometimes uh, neglect the uh, victim and witness. This is uh, uh, that we need to in Indonesia, especially work uh, harder for this, especially for from the legal rights uh, organization. And uh, in terms of uh, service collaboration, uh, what Beb uh, said before, uh, I agree that uh, service collaboration is uh, needed uh, from all of the law enforcement organization and also the assistance. But sometimes it is not easy, especially in the new normal, because uh, victims sometimes also uh, can come to the safe house because uh, they need some uh, uh, health protocol, for example. But uh, in the hardest situation, and we, we found some uh, cases uh, during the pandemic of it. And uh, I will come to uh, other uh, uh, chapter with a sensitive court, uh, victim sensitive court, yeah. Uh, like I said before, the victim or witness is, lang uh, is less being assisted. Uh, it is also not easy to have safe place uh, with uh, attending to the court uh, when they want to come to the court, especially also for children. Uh, in the case uh, the offender are adult, uh, this is also not a uh, criminal justice system law, but children sometimes, uh, there is also one case in uh, two years ago that the, the victim uh, met the offenders in the court. Yeah, this is like uh, some, yeah, this is in the uh, east of Indonesia, it's very fun. Yeah, it's like uh, the safety of the victim and witness is uh, uh, underlined here. And even in Indonesia, we do have uh, witness and victim uh, organization uh, and also uh, the protection of a victim and witness law. But uh, and uh, including institution, but the practice is not as easy as uh, the the regulation. And uh, as a witness, mostly uh, the, the the situation uh, is not easy. Said uh, like I said before, uh, the offenders are more uh, being assisted by the uh, legal aids. Uh, this is also the result of our research. And uh, in in uh, to sum up, I guess that uh, in terms of uh, forensic, uh, I guess this is not easy. But we need to maximum uh, maximize our efforts uh, to reduce uh, victim uh, that will get more traumatic uh, situation against the hard situation again and. Uh, the expertise of the uh, human resources uh, need to be enhanced, uh, then uh, they can uh, give a better uh, service to the uh, children, even as a victim uh, and also as a witness. And uh, assisting to the witness and uh, uh, victim is also important, very, very important, uh, and we do need to uh, make or create some effort, uh, for example, a court and, uh, or a recording video just to reduce the potential of uh, traumatic situation. And the last, uh, I guess, uh, human resources uh, need to be enhanced here, uh, especially in Indonesia for the police. Uh, many times uh, they will move from one department to another department this is uh, rather than in the court and uh, the prosecutor's uh, uh, system uh, so that's uh, it, it, it is also need uh, uh, the serious uh, uh, program or policy and the facilities because uh, in fact we, we uh, to to protect the fit victim and also um, uh, the witness, uh, we need a more safe house in all of the uh, law process from the police uh, rehabilitation process and also the court. And yeah, uh, that's all I think uh, my comment, uh, Cham. I come back, uh, time is yours.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Iborita, for providing us a regional perspective and also giving us some examples of the Indonesian experience in this in this area and how to handle uh, victims of uh, violence, of, of also uh, children who are victims of crimes and sexual violence. Now, at this time, I'd like to now open the floor for questions and would invite Iburita again to join me in the session and pitch in the questions for uh, Dr. David and Prosecutor Lloyd. Um, we received advanced questions from some of the participants, from some of you who are listening right now. And we also now have questions on the floor in the Q&A box. Um, I turn over the floor once more to Iburita for some of the questions for uh, Dr. Wells and uh, Prosecutor Lloyd. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, David and Lord, uh, I have uh, three questions, but maybe I will start from uh, the first question. Uh, given your years of experience, uh, experiences uh, dealing with victims of crime, particularly sexual violence, what can judge, uh, prosecutors, lawyers, court personnel, and other state actors to do support victims? to encourage and support them to give evidence. Maybe the chance to uh, David first. Look, that's a, it's, that's a very big question. Um, but I think it's worth asking Victor what their perceptions were of the system. If you, if you go back a step, if you go into a hardware shop and purchase something, and it's a bad service chances are you'll give some feedback or you'll be asked what were your what was your experience of this service we should do the same with victims so it can start right at the front they make a phone call to a police officer who acts in a disbelieving way or belittles them or something like that they will drop out of the system immediately so i suppose what i'm saying is we start to look at each aspect from the moment of reporting, and even in situations where reports aren't made, why didn't you report it? And demystifying or addressing um, the apparent um, weaknesses in the whole process. Um, Lloyd explained what I think sounds like a wonderful system once it gets to court, but before that, um, there are a range of hurdles that uh, many victims need to uh, get over before they get there. So in short, ask victims um, why they didn't report, what it was like after they reported and address um, those sorts of situations. Yeah, and you, uh, Lout? Yes, I, I, I think that in terms of uh, the prosecutors, we can only support those that have officially come into the system uh, but culture change is is very important i think sending a message that it's okay to make a complaint and you'll be treated with respect and compassion if you do has to be the message that goes out if we're hoping that we can get a much higher percentage of people reporting um, sexual violence and at the moment it is greatly underreported. Uh, I think specialists um, so making sure that the first person you speak to at the police station is someone trained in how to interact with a, a victim is, is crucial. That first encounter um, is, is very significant in whether the matter will proceed further and uh, and you need specialist training uh, to to do that well okay the second question is uh, considering that victim of trafficking have different dynamic as uh, as the, from victim of domestic violence would the approach uh, be different Lyot and David uh, first come to Lyot first when the victim uh, is the victim of uh, uh, trafficking uh, yes, I think uh, I think the approach does need to be different. I think in 
in some instances, a victim of trafficking is even more vulnerable than someone who um, who may be um, be in a in a domestic um, offending situation, but not always. So I think really trying to assess how vulnerable a person is and why they're vulnerable in each instance is is crucial. You can't underestimate how difficult it is to complain when you're still living with the offender. Uh, so in in that regard, I, I think domestic um, uh, sexual assault cases are also um, there's a great amount of vulnerability there, but. Every case needs to be approached on on an individual mm. basis. What what is the particular challenge faced by this victim, and how do we assist them to to ease them through through the process? Okay, and you, David, uh, will you uh, treat differently for the victim of uh, trafficking? Look, perhaps my job's a little bit easier because they're um, effectively patients. And so I can focus on their, their health and welfare issues. But I'll just make a couple of points. I agree with everything Lloyd has just said, um, but add to the fact that um, many people who are trafficked have also been uh, victims of other forms of violence as well. That is, they may come from a life where their day-to-day -day existence was one of domestic or family violence. Secondly, that um, generally, both groups are vulnerable individuals. That is, um, I, I listed some of the, the, the groups who are more overrepresented, but they're vulnerable. And after that, they are often ashamed of what's occurred. They've been threatened. Um, they're alone. Um, they've had massive impacts uh, on their life and their family. So as Lloyd said, it's a matter of identifying the various threads that need to be picked up and addressed. Um, so in that sense, the medical issues are, 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 fair, are very similar. I suspect some of the legal issues will then go down a, a couple of different paths. Okay. Uh, and I guess this is the last question from a participant that I will read. Uh, tell us briefly your experiences to support victim when victim are children. Uh, comes to David first, then to Lyot. So I'll start with a little anecdote. Again, when I started my work, I was surprised that after a year of examining children, I've never, uh, well, I think I've been called to court once or twice, and I couldn't understand it. So I then went on and did a thesis around children in the criminal justice system. And out of that grew uh, some programs relating to closed circuit TV and uh, videotaped testimony. So I think, again, there are particular difficulties confronting children in this whole process. Um, some of the decisions will be made by a child, some will be made by their carers, particularly their parents. But I would be a very strong advocate for specific training um, of police, of um, lawyers and judges around the nuances of children. I mean, we do this in the health sphere, so we have uh, specialists, they call paediatrician or child psychologists or similar. And I would see considerable benefits and it's already happening to a degree. But if you're involved with hearing cases involving children, um, then you do need some particular uh, training. And secondly, in some countries, and certainly Australia was one of these, we had some very antiquated laws um, uh, around children and the weight that could be placed on their testimony. Um, they've largely uh, been addressed, but they still exist in some places. Thank you. Okay. And you lot, I guess you have a uh, big experience during your career. Yes. Yes, I do. And I think it's a very challenging area. I think children uh, have particularly difficult time uh, dealing with adversarial type questioning. So I, I think it's a very good advance in my jurisdiction to have an intermediary that is regulating the type of questions that can be asked. I think children want to um, 
seek approval and want to please. And if you're asking them um, propositional sort of questions that are suggesting the answer, you might get an answer to it rather than open-ended questions. And I, I think it's time for the courts to regulate the, the type of questions that are able to be asked of children to make sure that we're getting the best evidence rather than um, letting them be open to suggestions from the advocates. And I think that the witness intermediary is a very important step in that. Yeah, that's uh, true uh, that uh, the courts need uh, uh, providing question rather than uh, question anything. So I, uh, I think uh, from me, finish uh Cham and uh i give the time to you again thank you so much Iberita, david and lloyd insightful discussion indeed uh, we have some questions from our attendees and the first question would be about the witness intermediary uh, function lloyd the question is is it enacted under the australian law Still mute, Lloyd. Still mute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is legislation that provides for witness intermediaries. I, I think it's necessary for it to to be part of legislation because otherwise I, I think it is difficult for the courts to use intermediaries. Thank you so much. And this time I'll give this question to David. How could an invisible victim be possibly helped? David. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I I was referring, I suppose, to hidden victims. That is, um, individuals who who choose uh, or cannot um, access the system. Um, they don't make their complaint because um, they are fearful of the consequences, uh, be they real or, or otherwise. I think in many of these situations situations, again, um, the medical sphere is very important because every victim um, has the right or the, the choice of, of making a formal complaint or otherwise. That's, that's just inherent in our system. Um, so that if a person says, um, I have just been sexually assaulted or I'm a victim of trafficking, um, I do not want to involve the police, but I need some help, then that help will be provided. And part of that help might be to explore with them the reasons why they don't wish to progress with police or, or with an investigation. In some cases, you can resolve it. They might be fearful of cost. They might be fearful of retribution, etc. And it might be that the system can help them there. But we need to respect their decision around not reporting or otherwise. So. The, the, the so-called invisible victim is alive and well. Um, they probably represent the vast majority. Um, for instance, in sexual assaults, there is increasing evidence that probably only 10% of, of, of adult women who are sexually assaulted actually report. We, it's a nebulous figure. But um, as the system improves, whether it be the policing, the medical, the social, the legal system improves, I think we will be encouraged by seeing more people uh, being prepared to report and uh, become part of it. But I still think we need to explore alternative um, resolutions to this process because we will never get a system that satisfies um, a lot of people um, when the issue is around consent. But I won't go there. Um, so in short, um, invisible victims are those that choose not to report we respect that decision, but it is worth exploring um, and perhaps assisting in that regard. While we are on that area, David, what are your thoughts around, you know, some of the contemporary commentators on trafficking in persons saying that there should indeed be an alternative system apart or in conjunction or in parallel with the criminal justice process? that in dealing with uh, the trafficking in persons cases, victims should not mm. only be helped or assisted 
under a criminal justice system, that there could be other alternatives of rehabilitating them and, you know, uh, returning back to society. David. Yeah, I, look, I, I don't know I'm the right person to answer that. I, I, it's a very complicated um, um, situation. You know, on one hand, um, these are very serious allegations, um, very serious destructive behaviours. If you remove the criminal justice system from that process, are you sending a message that perhaps um, we're, we're softening our stance on that? And that none of us would, would want to go down that pathway. Let me give you a, a short anecdote. I was um, working in Africa and there was a situation where a young woman was sexually assaulted um, and it was in a, a relatively closed community. The leader of this community, the elder, um, asked the young woman to come and tell him what had happened, which he did. He then called in the young man who had made out, had the allegations were made against and asked him um, what had happened. He then called both of them back and said, I've listened to the story, I've heard some other issues. Um, I find that you, the young man, um, is guilty of doing this terrible event to this young woman. Your penalty is that you need to provide her with some livestock, some cattle as a penalty. Now, I was intrigued with this because, first of all, the case is resolved the same day. Secondly, it sends a very powerful message to the other members of that community. Thirdly, the victim of this, of this crime um, has got a tangible benefit from reporting and has improved her sort of economic standard. Now, they're very crude markers and so on. Look, I don't know about alternative pathways very much and I'd be very interested to see what Lloyd uh, might contribute to that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thank you so much. And I think uh, we pass the microphone to Lloyd. Uh, what do you have thoughts on thoughts on that question, Lloyd? To be honest, it, it's not my area of specialty either. I think I'm a specialist in taking matters through the the criminal justice system. I I do feel that for serious crimes, and I I think that there are a few crimes more serious than trafficking that uh, that you need to that we need to treat those matters with the utmost seriousness and, and punish those people who are involved. So I tend to think that um, although it has great challenges that that the imposition of penalties after a, a criminal trial is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, again, for Lloyd, this question is from a fellow prosecutor, Lloyd. The question is, does your country, Australia, allow the presentation of a video in-depth interview of a child in lieu of a court testimony? And if yes, under what conditions is it allowed and how do you deflect objections against it? it uh, we not only allow it, we require it in every case. So children do not give evidence um, within court testimony what I would call evidence in chief. They don't tell their story of what happened. The only thing that they do is answer questions from the lawyer for the uh, accused person who might want to test that version. But their version of events is recorded in advance and goes in as their evidence in every case. And it's set out in the legislation that that, that has to be done. Thank you. And I think this question is also for you, but uh, David and Iborita, please uh, feel free to provide your thoughts as well. What if the perpetrator is a minor? Yes. Uh, then uh, generally where the perpetrators are minor, we, we go down a different system in my country. We deal with the matter in a, in a different way. It, is generally dealt with in a specialist children's court where the uh, main aim is the rehabilitation, the best interests of, of the young person, the offender. 
so rehabilitation is much more prominent than punishment. The recorded evidence can still go in, but it's a very different, it's a more informal process. And uh, if they're under the age of 18, then very much different process that focuses less on punishment. Thank you so much, Lloyd. I think the whole area of children in conflict with the law deserves another webinar series. Uh, but do you have thoughts about this, uh, Ibo Rita? Yeah, I think uh, that's true because uh, the, best, uh, the best interest of the child, even they are uh, the perpetrator or offender, is still important because they are being offenders, uh, not because of their self, but also the situation, the parenting system uh, that influence uh, uh, their attitude. That's why uh, we hope that they can uh, pursue the, uh, their best future after uh, uh, the process of the law. Uh, we do uh, practice all of the uh, criminal justice system uh, law for the children, uh, criminal uh, delinquency. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's going since 2014, uh, but still uh, we want to review because uh, like I said before, it seemed to be the protection for the offender is uh, greater than for the victim and uh, the witness. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the, the point uh, of our evaluation. Thank you, uh, Iberita. David, would you have some thoughts yeah. about that? I don't have any uh, specific comments except to say that um, if, if you scratch between or underneath the surface of most useful perpetrators, um, there is a very troubled um, and often broken social network beneath them, family, friends and others. And the vast majority of these uh, young people uh, come from very disturbed backgrounds. So that's all I've got to contribute. Thank you, David. And this question is for you from a prosecutor from Indo Indonesia, uh, from Jawa Barat, Indonesia. The question is, how, do you, how to deal with victims, with child victims resulting from sexual violence who have experienced severe trauma so that it is difficult to find information from them? I, I, that's a really tough question. I mean, you, you, severe sexual violence can uh, cause major um, psychological, psychiatric sequelae. Um, some people much more prone to it than others. Um, I think in these situations, well, I don't think that the, the priority must be the health and welfare of that individual. And even if that means sacrificing a case, um, so be it. Uh, you can't ever justify further damage to a child uh, by forcing them uh, through a legal process that in itself uh, might be confronting and damaging. So um, the early involvement of uh, specialist child psychiatrists in particular as to whether the child is able to give evidence and what the effect of that might be uh, should be built into any decision by the courts to proceed. And thank you. And this time, I think all of you, uh, Iborita, uh, David and Lloyd can answer the question about the dynamics of the victim where the perpetrator is either a parent or a close relative or someone from the home. Uh, so what are your thoughts about it? I think we go to Iborita first because I saw your reaction once you heard the question. We've got a number of questions from the audience uh, here in our Q&A box. Yeah. Iborita. Yeah, that's a difficult situation. Sometimes uh, physical, uh, uh, sometimes uh, like incest, uh, sexual abuse, sometimes also physical, sometimes uh, psychological. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the situation is not easy because uh, to, to pursue that uh, there is uh, violence against children in terms of uh, sexual or uh, physical, uh, because uh, child protect child uh, is always or almost stay with the parents. So this is a difficult situation. But when uh, the society have uh, good support, 
or also the partner because sometimes for for the case of incest for example i found that many uh, the the uh, daughter uh, being incest by the father and i i found some cases that the mother support the father you can imagine because uh, the the uh, depending of the economic situation to the father uh, they ask the father to be released for example because of the poor situation of the mother uh, that's why uh, this is need uh, not only uh, protection for the children but also the family uh, uh, the mother for, for example uh, convince them uh, convince the mother to report the case because this is uh, uh, immoral uh, and we need to think about the future of the children, not only the, the future of uh, the father or the mother, but the children is much more important. That's uh, the situation in Indonesia that I found. Thank you, Iberita. And, I can feel how passionate you are about the topic. And yeah. uh, how about uh, Pro Prosecutor Lloyd? What, do you have, what are your thoughts about that? How do you handle cases like that? I think uh, mandatory reporting by uh, people who are in contact with children is very important. So uh, doctors, nurses, teachers, in my jurisdiction, there is a, a legal obligation on uh, people who, who get any information from a child that might suggest that uh, there's been sexual abuse that they have to report it and it can be dealt with in a way that um, that heightens the prospects of getting good evidence. So a teacher who get, hears something from a child has to report that and the a joint investigation team with health professionals and the police would, would act very quickly to protect the child remove them if they need to be removed from a dangerous situation and to take the evidence all in a very short period of time. So uh, if you don't in your jurisdiction have mandatory reporting, then I suggest that it is a very important first step. It's a criminal offence here if a, if a teacher or a doctor um, gets information about sexual abuse and doesn't report it immediately to the authorities. And they are registered as sexual offenders? Uh, well, I'm thinking more of, yes, we do register sexual offenders, but even if, you, if you're a teacher and you just heard something that suggested inappropriate sexual knowledge on the part of a young child, mm -hmm. then you need to report that information to the authorities. I think a lot of the time discovering um, incest and, and abuse within the family is, is the, a very difficult part of the process. Thank you. David? I don't know I've got a lot to add to that, except to say that the vast majority of uh, sexual abuse cases are committed um, by individuals who have legitimate access to the child. That is, uh, a parent, another family member, um, an extended family member, a youth leader. Um, Sexual offences committed by strangers against children are, are pretty rare. The second part, I agree totally with Lloyd. I think that uh, having the issue of mandatory reporting actually makes life easier for the professionals involved in a child's life. That is, we are obliged to breach confidentiality because um, there is no other way that a doctor or a police officer can resolve the case, can investigate it, can move forward unless there's a multidisciplinary team involved. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. I'll go uh, back shortly, I mean, quickly to Lloyd. There are questions about the WASOs. Uh, Lloyd, is this, uh, what, what's the structure here? Are they civil servants, volunteers? Uh, are they appointed by the courts or the prosecution service, uh, Lloyd? Yeah, they're, they're, they're employees employed by me. So they're part of, of my prosecution agency and um, reasonably well paid and people with a lot of experience in um, dealing with people who have, um, have experienced serious trauma 
and then they get good training within my office. So my prosecutors find them to be a great help and I find them to be a great help. I don't only go to the lawyers. If someone says to me, we should not proceed with this prosecution because the victim doesn't want to proceed, then I will go to the psychologist or the social worker and say, well, this is what the lawyer's saying. How do we, how do we assist them? How can we get them to, to trial? Because, uh, because they are in a good position to, to know whether that's an informed decision and whether it might be in the best interests of the, the person. So they're part of my office. They've grown quite significantly over my 10 years as the director because I think it's a, a very important part of the office that gives uh, a lot of value to the community. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions from our participants, but I'm afraid our time constrains us to move on to the next item in our agenda. But we are going to do our best to answer these questions. We are going to preserve these questions. Uh, well, as also in relation to preserving evidence, I'm sure a prosecutor lawyer is very familiar about it. Uh, we're going to preserve these questions and hopefully we can answer them at a later point. We're going to email uh, the answers to the participants who have posted questions in the Q&A box. And there's a lot of them. We have 37 questions and too bad we cannot take them up uh, at this time. Okay, uh, just a time check. It's now 3.51 Manila time and minus one hour of Bangkok and Jakarta time and the rest of uh, ASEAN. So for the purposes of recap, I'm going to give uh, two minutes to all of you, our panelists, uh, at this point and provide us uh, your uh, final thoughts uh, recapping the presentation and the discussions that we have had uh, based on your perspective and the expertise that you have provided us. Uh, may I start please with uh, David? Look, I suppose um, uh, I can be very brief. Uh, firstly, um, the interface of, of medicine, whether it be forensic medicine or other arms um, and the law is one that uh, has its challenges um, it often works very well. Sometimes it's flawed. Um, and the flaws aren't any particular issue. I don't think uh, forensic medicine is well developed in a number of places. Uh, forensic experts don't understand sometimes that their uh, duty is to the court. Uh, it is not to either party. Um, and so their objectivity and sometimes their willingness to go outside the boundaries of their knowledge get breached with um, very bad outcomes. Secondly, that we have a system that is large and cumbersome, um, and this does not necessarily work in the favour of the vulnerable individuals who um, uh, are need to use it. And thirdly, um, if we set up our system, the criminal justice system, as one that is established for the most vulnerable members of our community, then there is a long way to go to ensure that those vulnerable members are protected uh, and are heard. So that um, uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but having said that, um, there have been some very significant advances made in recent years. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wells. So good to hear from you about that. And uh, we go to Prosecutor Lloyd. Thank you. I, I think it's, it's so important that uh, we remember that this is a justice system and that justice is only achieved if, uh, if people are allowed to uh, tell their, their story and have a resolution by the court as to whether the case has been proved the right standard and where people have suffered extreme trauma it can be difficult for them to tell their story and uh, and we as um, as participants in the justice system our our aim is to have a fair trial but one where the the victim gets to tell their story and there are many things that we can do on a on a practical level to to make that happen. It starts with, um, with 
compassion and trying to solve the problems that these people are facing in order to to get them through um, the ordeal of, of a criminal trial. And uh, the, I think anyone who's working as a um, as a prosecutor in my organization have come into it because they see it as a a public service and that's a good start if uh, people are there wanting to to do good then um, then that's that's a great start for for trying to deliver justice and help people through the the system thank you so much and we go to Iburita. Yeah, thank you, Chair. This session gave me huge insight to see uh, education system. Uh, we do have some aim to give maximum prote protection for the victims, uh, especially for children uh, in the law enforcement process. Uh, that's why we need a good policy, uh, uh, the best human resources who handle uh, the law enforcement process and also the facilities. Uh, this is uh, to reduce the victims suffer from psychological, social, social and uh, physical uh, situation. Uh, so uh, the support of family uh, and the member of society also important. Uh, then in Indonesian case, this is very important Then uh, they are not being uh, victimization and the last uh, prevention is I guess the best way rather than uh, if, if they are being a victim uh, we need a, 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 a great effort to rehabilitate them and collaboration uh, among family society uh, NGO and also government is also important uh, because prevention is much more better than we handling the cases uh, that's from me, Jen. Thanks. Thank you so much. It, uh, thank you for the great conversation. It was a, I've heard a lot of uh, profound uh, matters concerning victims, victims of violence, children, not only children, but you know, also women and uh, victims of trafficking in general from the three of you. And I think it has been a very fruitful afternoon, uh, not only from a theoretical and symbolic perspective, but the actual practical application of some of these principles Doug, that you have shared with us this afternoon. So I thank you, Dr. David Wells, Prosecutor Lloyd Babb, and uh, Iburita Pranawati. I think we provided the audience this afternoon with a holistic view from a forensic perspective to that of a prosecutor and to the victim side uh, in the face of uh, Ibo Rita, not only from the Australian experience, but also in the ASEAN uh, uh, experience via our audience, the questions and the insights pro provided by Ibo Rita this afternoon. And at this point, I think we are now ready to close much as we regret to close uh, the session, I would like to invite, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the team leader of the ASEAN Australia Counter Trafficking Program, Erin uh, Anderson, to provide us her closing remarks to formally close this event and maybe also hear from her some of her thoughts about the conversation that has just happened. Erin, you have the floor. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you very much um, for your time this afternoon. Um, it has been at times a difficult conversation, um, but also one that is a very important one for us all to continue to have. Um, and I particularly um, like that I'm coming away from this with a very clear message from Ibu Rita, Dr. David and Prosecutor Babb that we need to put victim-centeredness at the centre of our practice and that we need to consider in our practice that when we are supporting uh, victims through the justice system, the best interests of the victim are a central part of how the system should operate, but also how we should operate as practitioners within that system. 
So firstly, I'd like to thank uh, our first secretary, Danielle Seaver from uh, the Australian Mission to ASEAN for her opening remarks. Um, I'd also again like to thank our three panelists this afternoon for their excellent thoughts and reflections and also for being um, very open to receiving questions. Um, it's not an easy thing to answer questions in these webinars. Um, and I think we've had some great answers this afternoon. Um, to all of our attendees, we're very fortunate to have you as participants from across the ASEAN member states and other parts of the world with us here today. And we thank you for your continued support and interest and thirst for knowledge. Um, it's an ongoing commitment for us to provide all of you the opportunity to continue to enhance knowledge, especially on issues of counter trafficking, but more broadly on issues within the justice system. And we hope that by sharing some of this information with you today, that you'll be able to take it back to your workplace uh, or to your universities or areas of learning to enhance your effective and sensitive handling um, of vulnerable victims of crime, particularly victims of trafficking. We will continue to build on this series of webinars. Uh, and this year in 2020, we were able to deliver six webinars. We look forward to continuing these in 2021. And um, I look forward to welcoming you all back in 2021 and wish you all a happy, healthy new year and holiday season. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Erin, for the heartfelt remarks. To uh, Dr. Wells, Prosecutor Lloyd, Iborita, thank you so much. You have all been wonderful. And on behalf of ASEAN Act, our deepest gratitude to the three of you. And of course, thank you to, to our team leader. And to the all 700 strong attendees that we have had uh, this afternoon, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for your participation and for providing us your questions. Uh, please do not uh, forget to send us your feedback. The link, I think, is uh, posted in the chat box. And to all of you, stay safe and enjoy the rest of the week. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Layat. Yeah. yeah.